The days are coming when I will fulfill the promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. We are in the fourth week of Advent, in the fourth week in our current message series, a series that wraps up on Christmas Eve. And obviously this Christmas is special. Given our experience of Christmas 2020, this Christmas is special. Hopefully more people are more comfortable with holiday gatherings and family parties, perhaps even coming to church. But at the same time, of course, we still live with great uncertainty, fresh uncertainty just this week. Whatever your plans or approach to this Christmas, this Christmas, like every Christmas, holds promise, a hope that the season will bring good things into our homes and our hearts. And so for this season of Advent, we've been looking at promise, the promise of Christmas. When we speak of something or someone as having promise, we believe there's good grounds for great expectation. A promise creates an anticipation for the future. It fills us with hope for the future. And we need hope if we're going to live with any sense of purpose. A promise is especially powerful when it comes to relationships, even our relationship with God perhaps especially our relationship with God, because God is a God of promises, and God can be trusted when he makes a promise. And throughout the Bible, God makes hundreds of promises. And while some of God's promises were specific and nuanced and conditional, there was one promise God made over and over again. It was, of course, the promise of a Messiah, a Savior. Over thousands of years, to thousands of people, God promised a Savior. And because of this overarching promise, the people of Israel lived in a state of anticipation. For all their faults and failures, despite the chaos and calamity of so much of their history, they lived in a state of anticipation. God made this promise of a savior over and over again, and each time he did, he added clues. Clues on who it would be, how it would be, when it would be. He gave clues to all the prophets and patriarchs. And so these Advent Sundays, we've been looking at just some of the scripture verses pointing to the coming of the Christ, that first Christmas, and what it might mean for us this Christmas. As always, if you missed any or all of this series, you can catch up online on demand. Today we're going to look at one of the clearest predictions of the coming of the Messiah in all of Scripture. In some ways, it was the most basic, the most specific prophecy because this prophecy centered on where the Messiah would be born goes like this. Thus says the Lord, you, Bethlehem, that's a town, Ephrathah, that's the region in which the town is located, Bethlehem too small to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come, for me, one who is to be the ruler of Israel. So it was the prophet Micah who foretold the birthplace of the Messiah. FYI, the name Micah is Michael. Micah lived about 700 years before Christ. He was a contemporary of the prophet Isaiah. And the book of the Bible named after him is short. It's only seven chapters long. But like other Old Testament prophets, Micah presents a challenging message about repentance and renewal, but ultimately a hopeful message too, as he points quite specifically to the coming Savior in Bethlehem. Why Bethlehem? What's the significance of Bethlehem? 
Well, for one thing, it was an extremely modest setting, that's for sure, exactly what God wanted for the birth of his son. His birth in Bethlehem aligned Jesus radically with the poor, the marginalized, the neglected, the forgotten, because Bethlehem was all of those things. Bethlehem was, was chosen for another reason, too. In story after story in Scripture, we see God accomplish his purposes with the most unlikely people in the most unlikely of places. God chose Bethlehem because it was the least likely place. By the way, if you ever think of yourself as too small or having too little influence, too flawed to make an impact for God... You're wrong. You're quite mistaken. Whoever you are, whatever you've done, whatever your faults or failures, God can use you for his purposes. Bethlehem teaches us that. A third reason God chose Bethlehem comes earlier in Scripture. It takes place in the book of 1 Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem, for from his sons I have decided on a king. Bethlehem was the birthplace and hometown of Israel's greatest king, King David. Later, God would promise David that the Messiah would come from his family, his lineage. Bethlehem, impoverished as it was, was the birthplace of kings. There is one other reason God chose Bethlehem. That word, Bethlehem, which is really a phrase, means house of bread. House of bread. Our most basic need is the need for nourishment. We need to nourish and replenish our bodies daily. Bread was a staple of the ancient diet and provided for this most basic of needs. And as such, it took on vast symbolic value regarding God's gifts and and grace. The most famous period in the history of Israel, the Exodus, was only possible because of bread. The bread from heaven, the manna that the people received each day. Later, bread was used in temple worship to represent God's presence and provision. A presence and provision intended to satisfy not just the body, but the spirit, the soul. Later still, Jesus' most public miracles involved the multiplication of bread. This all came to a culmination on the night before he died, when Jesus gave us the gift of the Eucharist, a gift which he had earlier introduced in his teaching when he said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. We're nourished by the Lord in lots of ways, of course. We're nourished by Jesus through God's word. We're nourished through our prayer. We're nourished by Jesus as we come together in fellowship with other Christ followers and share our faith. We're nourished when we undertake Christian service and charity when we give with open and generous hearts. Absolutely, we are nourished when we join church online. But most of all, first of all, above all, we are nourished by Jesus as we receive him here in the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the source and summit of our lives as Christ followers. This Christmas Eve, we're celebrating Mass for the first time ever here in our new church facility on Ridgely Road. And I would like to invite and encourage as many of you as are here in North Baltimore to join us in person on Ridgely Road. We respect everyone who chooses to stay at home for sure, And that's why we make such a tremendous investment in our online broadcast, undoubtedly the highest quality available. We welcome, we appreciate, we love our online parishioners. But I would like to address for a moment those who have considered 
coming here to Ridgely Road on Christmas Eve, but have pushed back saying that if they end up in a video venue, they might as well stay at home. It's true. The church's 1,500 seats will be first come, first serve, no reservations, no saving seats. Everyone else will be invited to a video venue, or you can go directly to the venue of your choice. We'll offer video venues in the theater, the Vision Cafe, and a smaller venue in the pavilion. And here are my very best arguments, top 10 reasons why our venues will be great options for you and your family this Christmas Eve. Number 10, it'll be fun and festive to get dressed up and see everyone come together for the evening after missing out on Christmas Eve last year. The experience of coming together, praying together, singing together, it'll be exceptional, it'll be inspiring, it'll be, it'll be good for your soul. Number nine, unlike the church, you can save all the seats you want to in your venue of choice and your friends and family can sit together. Number eight, the pavilion will offer family-friendly seating for families who choose to keep their little children with them. There'll be a play area adjacent to the seating area where little kids can run around and have fun. Number seven, the Vision Cafe with a huge LED screen will require masks, offering a more comfortable setting for those concerned about crowds and social distancing. Number six, in the theater, we will be inaugurating, inaugurating for the first time ever on Christmas Eve amazing new technology that we have been working on for months, including three, not one, not two, but three LED screens. It will be a jaw-dropping experience, and I have it on the best authority that if you want to take a peek after Mass, they're going to let you do that. Number five. Each venue will be beautifully decorated, and each will be staffed with our host team ministers and venue MCs helping to create an engaging environment. Number four, there'll be live music in each venue as part of the pre-mass program. Number three, even if you're seated in a venue, the All-Stars program will be available for little kids and time travelers will be offered for school-age kids. Your children and grandchildren will absolutely love it, and you'll get a little Christmas Eve break from the kids while they're gone. That in itself could be worth coming for. The number two reason is simple. Let's face it. The Cow Palace was a video venue. You couldn't see the altar from where you were seated. <laughs> You participated via screens, and it was fine. It was great. But the number one reason to join us is the most obvious one of all, communion, holy communion. You can attend Mass and receive communion this Christmas. The prophet Micah foretold that Christ would be born in Bethlehem. Christ, the Savior of the whole wide world, was given to us in a house of bread. That's what we are. That's what nativity is, a house of bread in which we encounter the living Lord, the real presence of Christ in communion. Please join us. Please join us as we share communion this Christmas. It'll be amazing. I promise.